All right, hello everyone. Um, I see folks are still coming into the room, that's fine. We're just gonna go ahead and get introductions out of the way and get started. First off to everybody who's here now, thank you for joining us for the Consumer Product Safety Commission's webinar today. Our topic is gonna be CPSC Safety 101 and an importing overview. You'll have two presenters today. The first will be myself, I'm Shelby Mathis. I'm the Small Business Ombudsman at the CPSC and joining me is Marcy. Hi everyone, I'm Marcy Van Winkle. I am a compliance investigator with the Office of Import Surveillance at the Port of Tacoma, Seattle. And uh, today's presentation is, we're going to take up just about the full two hour period. Uh, the great news is that there will be plenty of time for you guys to ask questions. You can ask questions throughout the presentation today, but I do wanna kind of give you a broad overview of what we're expecting for the next uh, two hours. We've got a presentation that's broken really into three sections. The first is going to be Safety 101, which I will be presenting. And during the Safety 101 section, obviously I'm gonna cover the requirements for children's products, toys, general use products. I'm also gonna highlight testing exceptions and exemptions that may be of benefit to the folks attending today. I'm gonna give a regulatory update where I talk about some of the changes and uh, in the mandatory safety standards and the regulations that have happened from present day going all the way back to January of 2019. And I'm gonna talk about COVID-19 related consumer products that you may be wondering about. Our agency has uh, just posted a new business education page on this topic, and we're gonna talk about some of those products and you'll get an opportunity to ask questions. And throughout this whole time while I'm doing Safety 101, which can sometimes be a little dry, I'm gonna do audience polling and we're gonna see how we do on questions that I pose to you and how you as a group perform. And then uh, I'm gonna, take questions from the audience, and then I will turn it over to Marcy, who's gonna give an importing overview. Yes, and my portion of the presentation will cover how CPSC functions at the port. So we'll cover targeting, screening, we'll cover the detention and conditional release processes, and also what happens behind the scenes when products are being evaluated and tested at the CPSC laboratory. We'll also review the detention and violation rates for fiscal year 2019. And I will give a brief overview of the two-way messaging, which is set to roll out as early as this, this Thursday, September 24th, 2020. And at the end of Marcy's presentation on the importing overview, she's gonna take questions from you guys based on the content she provides. And then we're gonna have the final section, which is actually going to be uh, something that we would normally do in person. We're gonna play you a series of field screening demonstration videos where Marcy is actually gonna show you uh, what she would normally be doing at the Port of Seattle or what she does at the Port of Seattle um, and highlight some products uh, that are violative and explain why they are violative. And then again, at the end of that video portion, you'll have an opportunity to ask us questions. Um, so with all that said, I've got just a few housekeeping things to go through before we get started. The first is, I feel like we're all living in a very digital virtual world now, so you probably know all this, but if you are not familiar with this program, on the right-hand side of your screen, you have a control panel that will allow you to do a few things. It's gonna allow you to submit questions to us via the questions chat feature. We have CPSC, folks that are attending while Marcy and I are presenting that may be able to write you back with an answer to your question, or Marcy or I may address it um, in each of the three sections uh, that we just discussed when we're handling audience questions. You also have the ability to download a copy of today's slides as a handout, which is a PDF available in the handout section of your control panel on the right-hand side. Uh, I have been told when you click the handout, you'll wanna make sure that you download it because if you're just viewing it in a web browser and you start clicking hyperlinks, you will potentially lose the ability to watch this webinar. It will change your screen potentially to whatever link you have selected. So just make sure you're downloading a PDF of the slides um, and you know follow along uh, while we're doing the webinar today. 
The only other thing that I have to say, and it's something we always say before I kick off the Safety 101 section, is that the disclaimer, the standard disclaimer, the presentation today was prepared by CPSC staff, with specifically myself and Marcy Van Winkle. Uh, we are not commissioners, and therefore uh, the views expressed here today may not necessarily reflect the views of the commission. So for the Safety 101 agenda, I am going to start with children's products and give you a broad overview of the requirements that apply to every children's product, and we'll talk about what the definition of a children's product is. I'll talk about children's toys and the requirements specific to children's toys. Then we'll move to durable infant and toddler products, just like the two durables that you see on your screen, the stroller, and also the carrier system. And then we'll move to apparel and sleepwear, and this will cover adult and children's sleepwear requirements. Again, each time there's a testing requirement, I'm gonna do my best to highlight the testing exceptions and exemptions that could apply. Then I'll move to general use products and talk about the requirements there from a general certificate of conformity standpoint, and then talk about COVID-19 products and the updated guidance that our agency has released related to consumer products that may relate to COVID-19. I'll do a regulatory update, and as I mentioned, it's gonna go from present day rulemaking all the way back to January of 2019, so it'll be a nice snapshot for the past two calendar years of the regulatory updates and standard updates that our agency has issued. And then we'll do audience Q&A. So start with a children's product overview. First of all, what is a children's product? It is a product that is primarily intended for ages 12 and under. The first thing I wanna highlight here is that in terms of requirements with complying with um, you know, the labeling, testing, and certification requirements that we're gonna go through today, it's really the responsibility of domestic manufacturers and US importers. They are the responsible parties from the CPSC standpoint. So I know we've got a lot of those folks on the line here today and I really appreciate your attendance. For children's products, there is a permanent tracking information requirement that applies to every children's product. We'll go into more detail there, but it's also known as a tracking label. There are testing requirements that apply to all children's products that are intended for ages 12 and under, and it, that is total leg content and accessible components. The limit is 100 parts per million. Lead in paint and surface coatings, the limit there is 90 parts per million. Phthalates testing, and the limit is 0.1% per band phthalate. We'll talk about that more in detail of what those phthalates are, but that testing applies to all toys and childcare articles. And again, we'll talk about the definition of a childcare article. And all children's products require third-party testing be done at a CPSC accepted testing lab. Children's products also require certification in a children's product certificate or a CPC. So let's look at each of these requirements a little bit more in depth. So first off, tracking information. This is probably one of the hottest topic areas that we get questions about in our small business ombudsman office. The key takeaways here are that tracking labels need to be permanently affixed, meaning you know we're not talking about a post-it note here. We need something that's going to stick to the product and the packaging. It needs to be on the product and the packaging where practicable to do so. Um, and the identifying information that the tracking label needs to contain are manufacturer or private label or name, location and date of production of the product, detailed information on the manufacturing process, such as batch or run number, and any other information to ascertain the source of the product and in this case, we usually uh, give folks a recommendation that they maybe put their company website there as an uh, other piece of information to ascertain the source of the product. I cannot recommend highly enough our tracking label website, which is available at the site on, shown on your screen. Again, you are looking at a picture of my screen for me. This is a clickable hyperlink for you. This is just a picture. So if you do want a copy of the slides, that have the clickable hyperlinks. Again, you'll need to download the handout from your right-hand uh, toolbar so that you'll be able to follow that link. But the nice thing about the tracking labels page is that the frequently asked questions cover a lot of things that we hear quite often about tracking labels and um, different circumstances and what to do um, based on the product type. So we think you'll find some helpful information there and recommend that you visit that page. 
So I mentioned I'm going to be doing audience polling. We've come to our first audience poll question, and this question is actually on tracking labels. So the question is, I sell children's products in clear packaging. In this case, it's a poly bag and already have a tracking label on the product itself. Do I also need to put a tracking label on the clear packaging? And your answer options are yes or no. I'm gonna launch the poll. I'm going to ask you guys to tell me whether or not tracking labels are needed on the clear poly bag in this case. All right, and I'm gonna give folks just a few more seconds to get their answers in. Thank you everybody for voting. All right, I'm gonna close the poll and let's see what we as a group thought the answer was. Oh my goodness, this is why this is such a great question. It looks like we're almost evenly split between yes and no. So to the question of whether or not you put a tracking label on the clear poly bag. Let's see what the right answer is. It looks like the majority just barely said the answer was yes. The correct answer here is actually no. And this is a new question that we've just added to the tracking labels page. Uh, and the reason that the answer is no is that our staff has interpreted that if all tracking information is visible on the product through outer or clear packaging, so a clear poly bag for something like a children's shirt would certainly meet that standard, then there is not a requirement that you include a tracking label on the clear poly bag itself. So the next testing requirement, that, or I guess the first testing requirement that I wanna talk about is total lead content testing. And this comes from the US code. The limit is 100 parts per million in accessible component parts. But the thing I wanna highlight really here is that there are several substances that you can make a children's product out of that based on years of testing at the CPSC, we know are not going to exceed the lead limits. And those substances are listed in our regulation 1500.91, which again is hyperlinked in your handout. And those materials are wood, paper, and similar materials, CMYK process printing inks, and CMYK process printing inks are inks that, do, that fully absorb into a substrate. So they don't sit on the surface, they can't be scraped off. Natural fibers that are dyed or undyed, manufactured fibers that are dyed or undyed, precious and semi-precious gemstones and other minerals. So what does this mean, this 1500.91 mean? It means that if you are making a children's product where lead testing applies, lead testing applies to all children's products if they're meant for ages 12 and under, and your product is made completely of one of the substances listed here, maybe it's completely made of wood, then you would fall under the lead testing exception of 1500.91. You can find out more information about the materials by visiting the actual regulation itself and by visiting our lead testing page at the site shown on your screen. So the next testing requirement that applies to all children's products is lead in paint and surface coatings. And this actually comes from our regulation 1303. The limit is 90 parts per million in paint or surface coatings. And we define a surface coating as something that does not absorb into the substrate. So it sits on the surface. If you were to scrape a razor blade across the top, then that substance would, would flake off. So unfortunately, unlike lead, which we just talked about, had some uh, determinations that didn't, or substances that didn't require lead testing, Lead in paint and surface coatings does not have any exceptions or exemptions. So if this, uh, if you're making a children's product and it contains paint or surface coatings, or if you're importing a children's product that contains paint or surface coatings, you're going to need to do lead in paint and surface coatings testing. In this case, the majority of screen printed fabrics generally require this test, as do painted zippers and snaps. And in the case of painted zippers and snaps, they will need to be tested for both total lead content, which is going to be done on the substrate itself, and lead in paint on the surface coatings themselves. And again, we have a lead in paint um, business education page that is available at this site uh, 
shown on your screen. Now the next test that I want to move on to is one that can sometimes trip folks up and that's actually phthalates testing. Phthalates are chemical plasticizers used in the production of many types of plastics, also in certain inks, paints, and other products. And this testing applies to the plasticized parts of both toys and childcare articles. So we've defined what a phthalate is, let's define what a childcare article is. Well, a childcare article is an item for a child under the age of three that facilitates eating or sleeping or helps a child in sucking or teething. An example would be a children's bib or children's sleepwear if it's meant for children ages three and under. So we also have a phthalates business guidance page, which I would encourage everybody to visit. The site is uh, at the address shown on your screen. So I mentioned we get a lot of questions about phthalates. I think it's time uh, for another audience poll, and this one is gonna be on phthalates. So the question here is, I am importing reusable cloth diapers that have plasticized components. Do these diapers require phthalates testing? and your options are yes or no. All right, answers are furiously coming in. I'm gonna give folks just a little bit more time to get their guesses in on whether or not reusable cloth diapers, plasticized components would require phthalates testing. All right, it looks like just about everybody has voted. Let's see what we as a group thought the answer was. It looks like the majority, 79%, thought that the reusable cloth diapers would require phthalates testing. So let's see if everybody was correct. This was kind of a tricky question. The answer here is actually no. Reusable cloth diapers are not considered childcare articles. And why is that? Well, childcare articles are defined as facilitating sleeping, feeding, sucking, or teething for children under age three. And I know many of you are probably around children under the age of three a lot more now than you used to be. And I am aware that a child under the age of three does an awful lot of sleeping, feeding, sucking, and teething, uh, regardless of what they're wearing. But it's not the cloth diapers that are actually facilitating any of those four functions. So as a result, reusable cloth diapers are not childcare articles and therefore would not require phthalates testing. However, other examples of childcare articles are children's sleepwear, which I mentioned in the previous slide, infant and toddler bottles, sippy cups, utensils, bibs, pacifiers, and teethers. And again, you can see our phthalates page for additional frequently asked questions. So we've talked about what phthalates are. We've talked about the types of products that require phthalates testing. Let's actually talk about the phthalates that have to be tested for. Phthalates testing comes from our regulation 1307. This became effective on April the 25th of 2018. And the regulation states that all children's toys and childcare articles must not contain more than 0.1% of any of the following eight phthalates. And each of the acronyms for the phthalates are listed after the eight phthalates shown. Now keep in mind, and I know I've mentioned this multiple times, the phthalates testing applies only to the plasticized component materials. So be that an ink, a surface coating, or an actual plastic part, that's what the phthalates testing would apply to. And each individual phthalate is subject to a separate 0.1% limit, which means that you could, in theory, have a children's toy or childcare article that contained 0.1% of every single one of these eight phthalates shown, and that would not be exceeding the 0.1% limit and it would be in uh, compliance with our regulation 1307. So just as I mentioned, there were testing determinations for lead or substances that you could make a product out of that wouldn't require lead testing. Our agency has done the same thing for phthalates testing, and we've made determinations regarding seven plastics. This uh, testing determination or testing exception 
comes from our regulation 1308. And this became effective actually in September of 2017, but re-effective in April 2018 when we finalized our phthalates regulation. The seven plastics, uh, if included in toys or childcare articles, are not required to undergo third-party testing for phthalates, and they are polypropylene, polyethylene, HIPS, ABS, GPPS, MIPS, and SHIPS. Um, so I, I'm happy to pronounce all the chemical compounds, but I think uh, for purposes of today's webinar, it's probably best if we just um, rely on the acronyms because I think you know folks ask us about ships or MIPS um, and don't spell out super high impact polystyrene. So let's move on to children's toys. By and large, the largest uh, category of consumer products that we receive questions about. For children's toys, they have to comply with the toy standard final rule, which is our regulation 1250. Our regulation 1250 incorporated as mandatory ASTM F963-17 with a modification that sound producing pull push toys must comply with the testing requirements outlined in our reg at 1250.2C instead of complying with the section for sound producing pull push toys from the toy standard. Um, so why do I point that out? Because that's the only modification that our agency put in place when we adopted as mandatory the U.S. toy standard ASTM F96317. So if you are manufacturing or importing into the U.S. a pull-push sound-producing toy, then just know that the testing requirements that you'll need to comply with are on the sound producing pull push toy are actually from our reg and not the section of the U.S. toy standard. Other than that, uh, F963-17, all the other uh, sections are required except for flammability testing, which I'll address in just a second uh, in a little bit more detail. So the ASTM F963-17 toy standard applies to toys manufactured on or after February the 28th of 2018 and requires that toys be tested to all applicable standards. The standard is available for purchase via ASTM.org. And it contains not only physical and mechanical use and abuse type test for the toys, but it also contains a chemical testing requirement for eight heavy elements, which you'll hear more from Marcy about in the field screening demo videos. Uh, those eight heavy elements in the toy standard also include lead and are in section 4.3.5.2. So I mentioned uh, sound producing pull push toys have a different um, testing requirement applicable to them based on our reg. Flammability testing, which is included in the U.S. toy standard at section 4.2, is not mandatory on toys that are not primarily intended to be used near a flame source. So what does that mean? Uh, this actually comes from the CPSIA or Public Law 110.314. So this is from Congress to us, um, an example of a toy that would be meant to be used near a flame source would be something like a play tent. If the advertising of the play tent shows children in the tent outside with a campfire or a fire pit in front of them, that would imply to a consumer when they were purchasing that product that it was meant to be used near a flame source. In that case, the CPSC would require flammability testing, but that is an exception to the general rule, which is that you know, something like a stuffed teddy bear is not primarily intended to be used near a flame source. The CPSC would not require flammability testing on a stuffed teddy bear, despite the fact that there is a flammability testing requirement within the toy standard itself. So we've talked about a lot of testing, uh, burden reduction type things on lead and phthalates. There are also ones for children's products, toys and childcare articles, specifically the heavy elements in the toy standard. If you are making a children's product, toy or childcare article out of unfinished or untreated wood. Our regulation 1251, which became effective in January of 2016, says that toys made from unfinished and untreated wood do not exceed the heavy elements of the toy standard. So unfinished and untreated wood means there's no added surface coatings, such as varnish, paint, shellac, or polyurethane, and no materials added to the wood substrate, such as stains, dyes, preservatives, antifungals, or insecticides. So this would be a testing exemption for unfinished and untreated wood for children's toys that are subject to the heavy elements testing from the toy standard. 
We have a similar or a companion regulation for engineered wood products that relates to lead testing, the heavy elements testing from the toy standard, and phthalates testing. This is our regulation 1252, and it became effective in July of 2018. In this case, products made from the following engineered wood products are exempt from third-party testing for lead, the ASTM F963 heavy elements, or phthalates. So those three things are particle board, hardwood plywood, or medium density fiber board. And then lastly, in terms of um, testing burden reduction, if you are um, making or importing a product that is comprised of unfinished manufactured fibers, that the unfinished manufactured fibers themselves would not require testing for heavy elements to the U.S. toy standard or phthalates testing, and that's pursuant to our regulation 1253. This testing burden reduction became effective on July 1st of 2020 and states the following. Products made from the following unfinished manufactured fibers are exempt from third-party testing for ASTM F963 elements or phthalates. So things, something like a stuffed toy would be a good example of something that could be made from an unfinished manufactured fiber, would in general be subject to the heavy elements, chemical tests associated with the toy standard, and phthalates testing applicable to children's toys if they were plasticized components. But if you're making a stuffed toy out of polyester or peat, nylon, polyurethane, or spandex, viscose rayon, natural rubber latex, acrylic, or moda acrylic, then pursuant to our regulation 1253, you would not be required to conduct either heavy elements testing under the toy standard or phthalates testing on that children's toy. All right, let's move on to small parts, which is another section that, that oftentimes trips folks up. Again, our regulation here is 1501. It's also part of the toy standard, section 4.6. It's known as small objects there. Small parts present a choking, aspiration, or ingestion hazard. And you're gonna hear a lot more about this from Marcy in the field screening demo videos. A small part fits entirely into a small part cylinder. And the reason that is shown in blue on your screen is because it's actually hyperlinked in your handout to the small part cylinder portion of our page. That includes the dimensions of the small part cylinder. For small parts, products that are intended for use by children under the age of three years cannot contain small parts. They are actually banned products. And products intended for children at least age three but less than age six, which contain small parts as received, must bear appropriate small parts warning labeling. And that labeling needs to be affixed to not only the product but also advertising. Uh, so I would encourage you, if you are making or importing a product intended for kids between the ages of three and six uh, that contains small parts as received, um, you know, something uh, very sm small akin to a Lego, then you're going to want to make sure you meet the small parts labeling requirements of regulations 1500.19, 1500.20, and 1500.121. And again, those are hyperlinked in your downloadable handout. So all children's products require that a children's product certificate be generated for them. Domestic manufacturers or US importers certify their products comply with applicable product safety rules through the children's product certificate or the CPC. It's required for all children's products. So anything meant for a child ages 12 and under would require a CPC. And the CPC itself and the supporting lab testing report must be in English and issued by the domestic manufacturer or U.S. importer. You can find out more information about the requirements for children's product certificates, including what goes into a certificate in the seven sections, by visiting our CPC website at the address shown on your screen. If you do visit that site, the great news is that we have two sample children's product certificates that are available on that site. We've got one for children's toy and one for children's clothing that you can basically use as a template to generate your own CPC. So in terms of availability of certificates, this is either a children's product certificate or a GCC, a general certificate of conformity for a general use product, which we'll cover in a second. Three things to remember here. The certificate must accompany each product or shipment covered by the certificate. A copy must be furnished to each distributor or retailer of the product 
although there is no requirement that you provide it to the ultimate consumer. And a copy must be made available upon request to CPSC and Customs. Electronic certificates have been approved by the Commission. The Commission voted by rule that certificates in electronic form are acceptable. However, they must be reasonably accessible to the Commission, so meaning our CPSC field folks have easy access to them, and they must be created no later than the time of shipment or first distribution within the United States, per our Regulation 1110.13. All right, so we've talked an awful lot about children's products as a whole. Let's move on to the special category of durable infant or toddler products. And what you're seeing on your screen is actually a screenshot of our durable infant and toddler products or durable infant or toddler products uh, business guidance page, which is available at the link shown at the bottom of your screen. You'll see there are 25 product categories that are listed there. And the reason they're all shown in blue is because the great news so that our uh, team in the Small Business Ombudsman Group has put together a business guidance page for each of these products. So if you are importing an infant swing and you wanna know what the labeling, testing, and certification requirements are for your infant swing, or you wanna know the definition of an infant swing because you're not sure if you are importing one, you can always go to the durables page, click infant swings, and it will take you right to the business guidance page and tell you each of the requirements for that product category. So durable infant or toddler products, those 25 categories that we just saw are all required to include a product registration card attached to the product. And this is from our regulation 1130. The product registration card needs to be postage prepaid and manufacturers of durable infant or toddler products are required to maintain records of the names, addresses, emails, and other contact info of consumers who register their product. Manufacturers of durables must also permanently place their manufacturer name and contact info, model name and number, and the date of manufacture of each durable product onto the product itself. And why is that so important? Well, those are the things you're actually asking the consumer to provide to you when they register their product with you. You're going to need the manufacturer name and contact info, model number and name, and the date of manufacture. So, you can find out more information about the requirements of product registration cards for durables by visiting our business education page at the link shown at the bottom of your screen, downloadable in the handout. All right, I can tell everybody is ready for another audience poll question because I, you know, I think the first two were very tricky. So now we've got our third one and it's on durables. I can't promise it's gonna be less tricky. The question here is, is which of these products require a product registration card to be attached to the product. And your option choices are a children's bicycle, a high chair, a pacifier, a stroller, or a ride-on toy car. And the good news here is you can select all that apply. So I'm gonna publish this poll on your screen. I'm essentially asking which of these are durable products. It's so neat to watch these poll answers come in. Thank you everybody for participating in the poll. I'm gonna give you just a few more seconds to get your answers in. Again, you can select all that apply, so feel free to select uh, as many of those five listed products as you think are durables and have a product registration card requirement applicable to them. All right, it looks like just about everybody's voted. I'm gonna close the poll. Let's see what we as a group thought the answer was here in terms of what required a product registration card. Okay, uh, it looks like high chair and stroller ran away with it, but children's bicycle and ride on toy car are pretty close. Um, so I would say by interpreting these results that high chair and stroller by and large were the winners. So. Uh, let's see if you guys were right that those are the two product categories that require an attached product registration card. 
See, I can't fool you guys. You know your durable infant or toddler products. You're exactly right. The high chair and stroller are the two durables, and they're the ones that require a product registration card. A children's bicycle does not. It's actually a bicycle. It's not a children's toy. It's not a durable, so it does not require a product registration card. A high chair is, of course, a durable, so it does. A pacifier is a child care article that facilitates sucking for a child under the age of three, but it is not a durable infant or toddler product. A stroller is, so it requires the card, and a ride-on toy car is a toy itself, so it does not require a product registration card because it is not a durable. All right, let's turn to uh, apparel. We're gonna talk about adult and children's apparel and the requirements here. For uh, general wearing apparel or day wear, as uh, we kind of term it, because it is not sleepwear, it's everything but sleepwear, uh, they, the day wear are subjected to the 1610 flammability testing requirements. So this applies to all adult and children's wearing apparel. The exceptions here are that hats, gloves, footwear, and inner lining fabrics do not need to comply with flammability testing as long as they meet the exceptions that are outlined in 1610. And on the flip side, children's sleepwear must meet a more stringent standard than the flammability testing requirements of 1610. Just as I've done with the lead testing requirements and phthalates testing requirements and the heavy elements for a toy standard, um, and I've talked about testing burden reduction and testing exceptions and exemptions, there are flammability testing exemptions that I want to bring to your attention. In 1610.1D, plain surface fabrics that are equal to or greater than 88.2 grams per square meter or 2.6 ounces per square yard do not require flammability testing to 1610. Plain and raised surface fabrics made of any combination of these fibers, regardless of their weight, also do not require flammability testing exemptions, and those are acrylic, moda acrylic, nylon, olefin, polyester, and wool. So common non-complying fabrics are sheer 100% rayon, sheer 100% silk, 100% rayon chenille, certain rayon or nylon chenille, certain polyester and cotton blends, and 100% cotton fleece, in addition to 100% cotton terry cloth, are common non-complying fabrics with the flammability testing requirements. So we talked a little bit ago about the fact that children's sleepwear have a more stringent flammability testing requirement that is applicable to them. Children's sleepwear means any wearing apparel sized larger than nine months through size 14 intended to be worn primarily for sleeping or activities related to sleep. Our agency has interpreted this to include nightgowns, pajamas, robes, or similar loungewear for children. So those are all considered children's sleepwear by our agency. And we look at several factors to determine if a garment is sleepwear, including the product's suitability for sleeping, the likelihood the garment will be used for sleeping, the garment and fabric features, how it's marketed, how it's merchandised or displayed, and its overall intended use. So children's sleepwear actually must pass the more stringent flammability requirements of our regulation 1615 if it's size nine months to 6X, or 1616 if it's size 7 to 14. And all fabrics and garments defined as children's sleepwear must be flame resistant and self-extinguish or not continue to burn when removed from a small open flame ignition source. There are three exceptions from children's sleepwear flammability testing. If you fall into these exceptions, you will still need to meet the flammability testing requirements of 1610, which we discussed earlier. Those three exceptions for children's sleepwear are diapers and underwear, infant garments that are size nine months or younger, and that is from our regulation 1610.1c, or tight-fitting garments. Tight-fitting sleepwear has sizing limitations, and this is something that we kind of have to explain uh, to small businesses pretty frequently because this is complicated. Uh, tight-fitting sleepwear would not need to meet the sleepwear flammability standard as long as it doesn't exceed the specific dimensions that are outlined in the regulation shown on your screen. 
So if the children's tight fitting sleepwear is size nine months to six X, it needs to not exceed the dimensions in 1615.10. Or if the tight fitting sleepwear is size seven to 14, it needs to not exceed the dimensions of 1616.2 M. And again, even if you are making tight fitting children's sleepwear that does not exceed these dimensions, it doesn't mean you're off the hook from a flammability testing standpoint. You still have to comply with 1610, which is the flammability of clothing textiles. You also are required for all children's tight fitting sleepwear to meet label and hang tag requirements. And let's talk about what that means. So you see, we've got two examples here. The first is a neck label. The neck label is required in all children's tight fitting sleepwear. It needs to be at least five point sans serif font in all capital letters set apart from other text by a line border on a contrasting background and not covered by other labels. So you see two uh, examples here on the left hand side of your screen. You see a traditional top sewn label that says in uh, the box wear snug fitting, not flame resistant. On the right hand side of your screen in the red example you see printed in the neck label itself just actually printed onto the fabric it says wear snug fitting not flame resistant so both of those would be compliant neck labels you also need to meet the hang tag requirement for children's tight fitting sleepwear and the hang tag must be yellow that color is actually specified in the code and the hang tag itself has dimensions that it must meet an example is shown in the bottom left of your screen. And uh, the Arial Helvetica black 18 point font needs to be used. And the text box needs to meet the dimensions shown on your screen. That yellow hang tag needs to state the following. For child safety, garment should fit snugly. This garment is not flame resistant. Loose fitting garment is more likely to catch fire. So the yellow hang tag shown here would be a compliant children's tight fitting sleepwear hang tag. All right, the last topic for children's apparel, something that uh, catches uh, importers and domestic manufacturers is drawstrings. The hazard here is that young children can be seriously injured or subject to fatal entanglement if the drawstrings of their upper outerwear catch or snag. Children's upper outerwear in sizes 2T through 12 cannot contain hood or neck drawstrings and children's upper outerwear in sizes 2T to 16 with waist and bottom drawstrings must meet ASTM F1816-97. So a question we often receive is what is children's upper outerwear defined as? Examples are jackets, ski vests, anoraks, and sweatshirts, and all children's upper outerwear should comply with the requirements of voluntary safety standard ASTM F1816 dash 97 to meet the drawstring requirements from the CPSC. And again, this is another topic area that um, we're gonna see a demonstration from Marcy on how they field screen for drawstrings in children's apparel. All right, so we've made our way through the entire universe of children's products. Let's talk for just a moment about general use products. General use products are meant for age 13 and up. They're not primarily intended for children ages 12 and under, which would be a children's product. They're everything else. And there is a certain universe of general use products that require a general certificate of conformity or a GCC. And those are listed on your screen. You can see there's many categories that are construction related. You see architectural glazing materials, emberizing materials, consumer patching compounds, drywall, cellulose insulation, you also see categories of goods that you're probably familiar with from a flammability testing standpoint, things like carpets and rugs and mattresses. Uh, we've also got lighters there. The reason that these general use products are shown on the screen to require a general certificate of conformity is because there is a regulation or a safety rule associated with them in terms of labeling or safety testing requirements and a cert certification requirement flows from that. So if you are wondering whether or not the general use product that you are importing or manufacturing requires a GCC, I recommend that you visit our rules requiring a GCC page, which is hyperlinked at the bottom uh, of the screen and again, available as a clickable link in the downloadable handout today. 
All right, let's move on to probably the first new topic area um, for folks that attend a lot of our webinars. Much of the content that I've just discussed has been a bit of a refresher probably. COVID-19 related products. Um, when the pandemic started, we started getting questions about all kinds of consumer related products that were linked to COVID or prevention of coronavirus. The first one and the most common one that we got questions about were consumer face masks that are not meant for medical use. The things to remember here are that all consumer face masks are considered wearing apparel and they are therefore subject to flammability testing under our regulation 1610. If the consumer face mask, not for medical use, is meant for children, 12 and under, based on sizing, design, marketing, those sorts of things, will also be subject to total lead testing, lead in paint, the testing must be conducted at a CPSC accepted lab, and it's a children's product, so it requires a children's product certificate. For consumer face mask, I also wanna draw your attention to the fact that there are testing exceptions and exemptions, all of which we've covered today, for flammability, they're at 1610.1D. And for total lead content, if it's a children's face mask, those are at 1500.91 of our regulations. We've also gotten questions about non-medical gowns and gloves that are meant for patient or consumer wear. They have the same requirements as face masks above. So flammability for the gowns. Uh, if they are children's gowns, you'd also have the total lead content, lead and paint, testing at a CPSC accepted lab and CPC requirements. For gloves, gloves are likely exempted from flammability testing under 1610.1C2, which is a specific flammability testing exemption for gloves that meet certain dimensions. Uh, and another question we've gotten quite frequently is whether or not products that are disposable, specifically disposable gowns, need to be laundered uh, that is part of the 1610 flammability testing requirement? The answer there is no. Disposable gowns do not require laundering before flammability testing if they are not meant to be laundered in their uh, traditional use, meaning they are disposable. All of this information is available on our new COVID-19 related products business education page, which is available at cpsc.gov forward slash COVID-19. The other category of products that we've gotten a lot of questions about are cleaning products. So cleaning products, things to remember here is that the Poison Prevention Packaging Act or PPPA is under the CPSC jurisdiction. It requires that products that contain any of the substances listed in our regulation 16 CFR 1700.14 are in special packaging. And again, that regulation is hyperlinked in your handout so you can easily follow the link and look at the long list of substances that require special packaging. If your product contains any of those substances, you would need to meet the Poison Prevention Packaging Act packaging requirements. For consumer cleaning solutions, you also want to keep in mind that the Federal Hazardous Substances Act, or FHSA, labeling may apply if it meets the FHSA definitions. And again, there's more information about this on our COVID-19 business education page linked at the bottom of the slide. For soaps that are made of fats and alkalis, those also fall under the jurisdiction of the CPSC, and they would also potentially require FHSA labeling, again, if they met the definitions. And again, uh, best point of resource here, or point of contact, I guess, is probably um, to visit our COVID-19 page to get more information there on soaps. Hand sanitizers fall under the jurisdiction of the US Food and Drug Administration or the FDA. There's more information on the COVID page about that. Disinfectants are actually under the jurisdiction of the US Environmental Protection Agency, which maintains a list of registered disinfectants. That list is hyperlinked, again, in the downloadable handout. And then UV or ultraviolet disinfecting devices are under the jurisdiction of the FDA. All right, now I'll move on to a regulatory update. And as promised, I've started at present day and it actually goes backwards. So to um, get you accustomed to this chart on the left-hand side, I've listed the consumer product type. In the middle, I've got both things. The standard itself, which is the ASTM or ANSI ROVA standard in the case of um, ATVs at the end of this list, um, the safety standard and the regulation that incorporates that safety standard is mandatory. 
in the center of the chart, we've also made note of times when our agency has incorporated as mandatory an ASTM standard with a modification. And we've identified the modification where it was just a singular modification. And then we've got the effective date on the far right. So a few things to point out here. I won't belabor it. I know you guys, uh, you can certainly read and um, you are able to download the handout and have a copy of this for yourself. But two of these consumer product categories have standards that are becoming effective after today's date. Uh, in 2021. The first is gates and other enclosures. That new standard will become effective July the 6th of 2021, and that is uh, the first mandatory standard applicable to gates and other enclosures. Handheld infant carriers have an updated standard going into effect on January 1st of 2021. On this next page, you'll see that there are um, uh, mostly durable products. Actually, these are all durable products that have updated safety standards, and these became effective from December 2019, running back through mid-summer of 2019. Again, we've done uh, the same thing here, included the regulation number and also the mandatory safety standard that we've incorporated as mandatory. In this case, there were no modifications. And then finally, uh, the last group going back to effective dates in January of 2019, we've got infant bathtubs, portable hook-on chairs, and all-terrain vehicles. I do wanna bring two other things to your attention during this regulatory update. We've got a lot of folks attending today. Um, the great news is we had a lot of interest in this webinar. The even better news is, is that tomorrow, there is another webinar that our agency is participating in along with our colleagues at Health Canada and Profeco in Mexico, and it is a North America toy safety seminar happening tomorrow, Wednesday, September the 23rd, 2020, from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern. During that webinar, the three agencies in North, the government agencies in North America are going to compare and contrast their toy safety standards, and as I understand it, there is even a handout that is a chart that shows you across North America what the toy safety requirements are for the US, Canada, and Mexico. If you are interested in attending that webinar, you have the ability to register by following the link in the handout uh, available for download here. This is also available on our public calendar if you wanna go to cpsc.gov and just find it on our public calendar as well, but we would love to have folks register uh, for tomorrow's webinar and um, get to see CPSC Health Canada and Profeco presenting there. The last, Topic that I wanna cover in the regulatory update is that our agency is currently seeking public comment under a Regulatory Flexibility Act review of the product certification of children's products and the component part testing rules, that's 1107 and 1109. If you have experiences that you would like to share or changes you would like to see in the component part testing rules or product certification requirements of 1107 or 1109, please submit those to us by the deadline, which is Friday, October 23rd, you have the ability to submit comments through the Federal Register by clicking the hyperlink in the downloadable slides. All right, last thing here is our agency in January of 2020 published updates to our age determination guidelines. That document had previously been issued in 2002. The updated January 2020 document can be found in the hyperlink on the screen and staff has begun using these updated guidelines to make age determinations as of June 1st of 2020. Why is this important? This is now what our agency is using to make age determinations on your consumer products that you're importing or manufacturing. So you know, if your product says 18 months plus on the side, and there's a question as to whether or not that is appropriate, and samples are collected. Marcy will talk more about this in her demo videos. Samples are collected and they're sent to our testing lab and reviewed by our human factors staff. They are going to be relying on these new age determination guidelines to make a determination of whether 18 months plus is an appropriate age grade for that product. If you would like to see um, basically a summary of the edits or the updates between 2002 and 2020, your best bet is to watch the briefing to the commission on the updated document that's available on our CPSC YouTube channel at the address shown on your screen. All right, everybody who knows me knows that I couldn't do a presentation 
without heralding the benefits of using the regulatory robot. For those of you that have never used it, the regulatory robot is meant to be a one-stop shop to ask you a few questions about your consumer product and generate for you an end report that tells you all the labeling, testing, and certification requirements applicable to that product. It can be accessed at business.cpsc.gov forward slash robot. And I always have to give a disclaimer, which is that the robot is for general informational purposes only, and it's not meant to be legal advice. The end report is generated based on information provided by the user. So the questions and answers uh, that you provide are going to generate that end report. The benefits of using the regulatory robot. I've taken a screenshot of the landing page within the regulatory robot, which asks you to pick whether your consumer product falls into one of nine categories, which are shown on your screen. A few benefits here. You have a downloadable end report. The end report that tells you your testing, labeling, and certification requirements uh, is unique and it has a shareable URL, meaning you can copy the address of that generated end report and paste it into an email and send it to your manufacturer in another country. They can open the end report, and if their primary language is not English, they can easily toggle from English to another language using the top row that is shown on your screen in navy blue. Currently, the regulatory robot is multilingual and available completely in English, Spanish, simplified Chinese, traditional Chinese, and Korean for most of the nine categories shown on your screen. It's also available in Vietnamese and Bahasa Indonesia for some of the categories shown on your screen. Another business resource that you may find helpful are our business education pages. I talked about this on the durables page I showed that snapshot with the 25 product categories in light blue because they all had their own business education page associated with them. If you visit our business education landing page, which is cpsc.gov forward slash business education, you'll see on the right hand side alphabetized a list of consumer products. You can click on any of those consumer products and open up a page unique to that product category that will tell you all the requirements associated with that product type. At last count, there were 58 pages on the business education right rail, which is circled, um, that are going to provide that information to you. All right, the last uh, resource that I want to let you know about are our webinars. Just like today's webinar, we've recorded many webinars historically, and they are available via the CPSC YouTube channel, which is at youtube.com forward slash USCPSC. When you go to that page, you'll need to click playlist and business education. You can see there are 14 videos there. Of interest may be our webinar on certificates, where we talk about how to make a children's product certificate, what goes into one, uh, and show examples for different types of products. We also go through general certificates of conformity and how to create those and when you need to create them. That's a very popular webinar. Also popular is our stuffed toys webinar where we actually have some stuffed toys testing in the testing videos. All right, with all that said, uh, let me leave you with a few resources and then I'll take a few questions before I turn it over to Marcy. My name is Shelby Mathis, I'm the Small Business Ombudsman. If you have questions that you would rather email than you know, type into the box today, you're welcome to email our group at sbo at cpsc.gov and you'll hear from uh, any of the three folks on our team. You're also welcome to give us a call at 301-504-7945 and leave us a voicemail if we don't answer and uh, we'll get back to you and hopefully provide some helpful business guidance on a product that you're making or importing. You can also follow us on Twitter at CPSC Small Biz. I mentioned a regulatory robot and its address is shown on your screen. The desktop reference guide is a summation of all of the testing requirements, or most of them that I've talked about today. And then lastly, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't do a plug for our business newsletter. This is a monthly newsletter that I email out to folks that register to receive it. Things that I include are upcoming webinars, upcoming public hearings at the commission, um, rules that are, are mandatory standards that are going into effect, open comment periods, basically the things that I've shown you today, 
If you think that's of interest to you, please go to cpsc.gov forward slash email and sign up to receive our business newsletter. You'll need to include your email and select small business ombudsman updates to get our newsletter. Okay, with that, uh, I am conscious of time and I am going to take three questions from the audience. Let me give myself just a second to review a few of the questions and I will read them out. All right, I have a question here. Uh, does the CPSC require that a certificate, either a CPC or a GCC, be submitted and approved by the agency prior to importing products? The answer here is no. We are not an agency that requires you to submit things or get pre-approval before importing. However, there are two caveats there for uh, specific product types, and they are lighters and they are ATVs or all-terrain vehicles. Uh, but for the most part, um, that answer is no. The CPSC does not require that your certificate be submitted and approved by the agency prior to importing. And I guess with lighters and ATVs, I will caveat it. We're not looking for a certificate in that case. We're looking for other information, but it does require contacting us before an import on lighters and ATVs. Does the CPSC require that my product testing be conducted in the US? The answer there is no. I mentioned uh, earlier in the broadcast that children's products must be tested at a CPSC accepted lab. That is a requirement. However, CPSC accepted labs are all over the globe. So if you are importing or manufacturing a children's product meant for ages 12 and under, you do need to test at a CPSC accepted lab. However, we do not require you to test at a lab in the US. Um, for general use products, there is not a requirement that you test at a CPSC accepted lab. So uh, if you're hearing that there is a requirement that you test in the US, that may be a requirement um, specific to the retailer or distributor with which you're working. Okay, and uh, last question, and then I will turn it over to Marcy, is if I am relying on testing determinations or exemptions that you've shown here, how do I cite to them in a CPC or a GCC? Great question. Uh, the answer is those citations should go in section six of your children's product certificate or general certificate of conformity. And again, um, it's a shameless plug for the robot, but I can't help myself. One thing the robot does really well is the end report that it generates is broken out by testing requirement. And it will also highlight for you potentially applicable testing determinations that may benefit you and meaning that you don't need to get your product tested for lead because you fall under these testing exceptions. If that's the case, the robot actually tells you at the end of the section, uh, if you are relying on this testing determination, exception, exemption, cite this in section six of your children's product certificate or general certificate of conformity. So your best bet um, in properly citing those testing determinations or exemptions is probably to run a report in the regulatory robot and just follow the recommendations there. Um, you can also, of course, always get more information uh, by contacting us or by going to the individual product page on the business education landing page at cpsc.gov forward slash business education. All right, with that, I am going to turn it over to my co-presenter, uh, Marcy Van Winkle, who is going to take it from here. Hello, everyone. Again, Marcy Van Winkle here. I am a compliance investigator with the Office of Import Surveillance, and I'm based at the Seattle Tacoma port. So I am going to give you an overview of the import process. And again, as a disclaimer, this presentation was prepared by CPSC staff and may not necessarily reflect the views of the commission. Okay, again, the presentation agenda, I'm going to give you an overview of how CPSC functions at the port. We're going to cover targeting, screening, detention, and conditional release processes. And also what happens behind the scenes when products are being evaluated at our, <clears throat> our, at our CPSC laboratory. 
Also, we'll discuss the detention and violation rates for fiscal year 2019. And I will give you a brief overview of the two-way messaging, which again is set to roll out as early as this Thursday, September 24th, 2020. <clears throat> so I'm going to take you through this journey, if you will, through the CPSC port process. We'll follow this flowchart from the beginning when the entry is filed to the end, which is ideally the release of cargo into commerce. But as you can see and maybe even have experienced, the end may actually be seizure of the cargo. Now notice that this flowchart describes the import of ocean cargo. So although the examination of cargo is similar between modes of transportation, the targeting and detention procedures may differ significantly between seaports, airports, border ports, and express consignment ports such as DHL, FedEx, and UPS. But regardless of the mode of transportation, the goal of CPSC is always to ensure that only safe and compliant products make it to the hands of consumers. And we do this not only by screening products against the safety standards, but also by providing product line specific guidance directly to the importers and to the import community as a whole. Okay, so here we are at the first step. The customs broker has filed the entry into ACE or the automated commercial environment. ACE is a customs and border protection or CBP program, and it's the primary system through which the trade community reports imports and exports to the regulatory agencies, and the government determines admissibility. So how does CPSC target entries? <clears throat> entries can be targeted for or by CPSC in typically three different ways. The first is through the CTAC program or the targeting, the Commercial Targeting and Analysis Center. And CTAC is a CBP run program of which 11 partner government agencies are a part of, including CPSC, of course, Fish and Wildlife Service, FDA, APHIS, and EPA, just to name a few. CPSC may have several CTAC programs running at a time. A couple examples of these programs could include one that hits on past violators and continues to target them until a pattern of compliance can be established. Another example is a program that targets first-time importers and manufacturers of children's products. And the purpose of this program would be to ensure that new importers and manufacturers of children's products are complying with all applicable safety standards. The second method of targeting is via the RAM or the risk assessment methodology. And the RAM is a CPSC run program that feeds off the data entered into ACE. And RAM is updated every couple of minutes and includes only tariffs within CPSC's jurisdiction. Lastly, exams can be targeted by customs for CPSC or they can be customs exams and then referred to CPSC when product is discovered that may be under our jurisdiction. So if an entry is not targeted and the, the entry is released without an exam and the product is allowed to move into commerce. But if an entry is targeted, the container will move to a centralized exam station or a CES. So the exam site is responsible for offloading the cargo into the warehouse and when the shipment is on the floor and ready for exam, CBP will notify CPSC and we must take action within five business days. Take action means either to release, to detain, or to conditionally release a shipment. And we'll talk more about how this decision is made in a little bit. So, let me see if I can advance the slide. Here we go. Okay, so what happens at the exam site? So we screen products at the exam site and products are screened according to the applicable safety standards. 
Listed here are the primary statutes the CPSC administers, other than the ASTM F963, which is a voluntary standard. However, in 2008, the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act mandated that the voluntary toy standard become a nationwide mandatory children's product safety rule. So how do we screen products? Well, we screen products by using screening tools, templates, and screening guides. The two main pieces of equipment we use are the XRF and the FTIR. And I will be giving you a brief demonstration of these two pieces of equipment in the next portion of this presentation. We also use screening templates for certain types of products. We have screening templates for small parts, rattles, pacifiers, small balls, toys with spherical ends, and also an expanding materials template. And again, some of these templates will also be demonstrated for you. So here are some types of products that we screen at the port. These products are called regulatory products or regulated products because they have a mandatory standard by which they must comply. Examples of these include clothing, durable infant toddler products, rattles, children's toys, balloons, and much, much more. Any product that is under CPSC's jurisdiction but does not have a standard or a ban, a mandatory standard or ban is considered an unregulated product. Examples of these types of products may be like lawn chairs or bookshelves or adult snowboards, basically any consumer product under CPSC's jurisdiction for which there is no standard or ban. The burden to report defective or dangerous product to CPSC lies with the U.S. importers, the U.S. manufacturers, the U.S. distributors, and the U.S. retailers. And defective or dangerous product must be reported to the CPSC within 24 hours of becoming aware of the issue. Okay, so we have arrived at the first poll question of this presentation. Which product category does not have an applicable mandatory safety standard? So I'm gonna put the poll up for you and give you a minute or so to answer. Your options are matches, adult clothing, bed rails, or unicycles. I see that the answers are coming in. I'll give you another five seconds or so. Okay, we'll close the poll and see what you have answered. It looks like the majority of you, 41%, said unicycles with a close second of adult adult clothing. So let's see if you are correct. The correct answer is unicycles. So matches, adult clothing, bed rails all do have an applicable mandatory safety standard. Unicycles, uh, we do have a mandatory standard for bicycles, a bicycle is defined as a two-wheeled vehicle having a rear, a rear drive wheel that is solely human powered. And it's also defined as a two or three-wheeled vehicle with fully operable pedals and an electric motor that, has, uh, that is of less than one horsepower and whose maximum speed on a paved level surface is less than 20 miles an hour when powered solely by such a motor while ridden by an operator who weighs 170 pounds. That's a mouthful. But the short answer is because a unicycle is has one wheel, it's not considered a bicycle and there is no mandatory safety standard. Okay. So here we are still at the port and we're screening product according to the standard. If no violations are found, 
the entry is considered clean and released into commerce as far as CPSC purposes go. So what happens then when a product fails screening? When products fail screening, samples are collected from the shipment and sent to the CPSC laboratory for testing. When CPSC collects samples from an entry, a receipt and a notice is provided to customs, the customs broker and to the importer of record. Whether a notice of detention or a notice of conditional release is issued depends on a variety of issues, including the severity of the potential violation, the compliance history of the importer, and also CBP's procedures for that port. Okay, and the next, we have another poll question already. Who receives the CPSC notice of sampling and detention? Is it the broker, the importer, Customs and Border Protection, or all of the above? Go ahead and lock in your votes. Wonderful. I see. I see the votes coming in. We'll give you another five seconds. Okay, and we'll close the, the poll and look at your answers. And it looks like overwhelming majority said all of the above, 91%. And let's see if you are correct. You are all correct. You're all geniuses. Yep, that's true. The broker, the importer, and customs does do all get the notice of sampling and, con and detention, also the notice of sampling and condition relief, release. Okay. So here are the differences between a detention and a conditional release in a nutshell. In a detention, the product is held at the centralized exam station or CES until the completion of CPSC testing and evaluation. CPSC has our own detention authority, which is up to 60 days. CBP's detention authority, on the other hand, is 30 days. The 60-day detention can be extended and is extended on occasion, but the majority of detentions last approximately 45 days. In a conditional release, the product is held at the U.S. importer or consignee's premises until completion of CPSC testing and evaluation. The product under the conditional release cannot be distributed and is held under the importer or the broker's CBP bond. And just like in a detention, CPSC can hold product in the status for up to 60 days, which again can be extended. In my experience as an investigator, the majority of the time that detentions or conditional releases are extended beyond 60 days are the instances where the importer is unresponsive to CPSC's request for more information. All right, we are moving at a fast pace. We have already gotten to our next poll question. How long is CPSC's detention authority? Let's see if you've been paying attention. Is it 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, or we use CBP's detention authority? Go ahead and lock in your votes. Votes are coming in fast. Okay, another five seconds. Excellent, so we'll close the poll and we'll look at what you have voted. Most of you, 75%, have said that 60 days is C CPSC's detention authority. So let's see if you are correct. And it doesn't look like I can fool you, you are correct. 60 days is CPSC's detention authority. Very good. Okay, so here we are, um, a potential violation has been detected and the decision to detain has been made. 
And for the purposes of simplicity, we will also include the decision to conditional release in this step. Okay, so what happens now? Where do the samples go? The units for one sample are sent to different offices within CPSC for testing and evaluation. And the destination of the units is, and the number of units collected is dependent on the type of product and the type of testing required. In most cases, a unit is sent to a compliance officer within the Office of Compliance. Additionally, a unit could be sent to Human Factors. Human Factors is the office responsible for age grading the product. And again, remember, safety standards for children's products depend on the age of the child that product is primarily intended for. So if Human Factors determines the product is intended for 12 plus, then the lead, phthalate, tracking label, and certificate certification requirements do not apply. Again, and likely, likewise, if a product is primarily intended for a child over three years, then the small parts requirements do not apply. So the evaluation really begins at human factors to determine which safety standards the product must be tested against. Several units may be sent for chemical or mechanical testing in the CPSC laboratory. And again, the number of units is dependent on the potential violation. And one unit is typically stored at our sample storage facility. Samples are never returned to the shipment or to the importer after testing or evaluation. We always collect the minimum number of units in order to complete the required testing. Okay, so here we are again, the sample is at the lab. Now what happens next? Well, if the lab report comes back clean, the product did not produce small parts during use and abuse testing, or the product was found not to contain excessive lead, then the compliance officer will review the CPSC laboratory test report to ensure it's complete and will issue to CBP the recommendation to release the product into commerce without condition. If the product is, con is confirmed violative by the CPSC laboratory, the compliance officer again will review the test report, look at the firm's compliance history, and if the product can be corrected or reconditioned, the compliance officer may allow the importer to correct the product by bringing it into compliance. And if the product cannot be reconditioned or the importer has an extensive compliance history, the most likely outcome is seizure to prevent the violative product from entering commerce. So again, the options for a violative product are seizure, reconditioning, but also correct future production. This option is typically allowed only for administrative type violations, such as tracking label or certificate violations. But again, the compliance history of the importer is taken into account. A firm that continues to import product without required tracking labels or certificates after having been warned, for example, may be subject to seizure of their products. And when the decision has been made by the compliance officer either to seize release for reconditioning, correct future production, or unconditionally release, the compliance officer will issue a Form 330 to Customs and a notice of violation to the importer if applicable. Okay, so here we are at this point. The product was found violative and the compliance officer has allowed the product to be reconditioned into compliance. In most cases, the importer is required to bring the product into compliance within 90 days, but that time period is always specified in the notice of violation. The importer must provide proof of reconditioning, which can come in the form of updated third-party test reports and certificates, pictures of reconditioned product, and or a signed affidavit that the product is now compliant with all applicable standards. In some cases, a compliance investigator will be asked to physically verify that the reconditioning process has been completed. And when completed, another Form 330 is issued to Customs, 
requesting that the bond be removed from the product and releasing the product into commerce. If the importer is unable to complete the reconditioning within the allotted period of time, or elects not to recondition the products for whatever reason, whether it be the cost to do so or the time required is too extensive, the compliance officer may require that the importer re-deliver the product back to the port for seizure or may allow the importer to destroy the product. Okay, so here we have completed the process from entry to either release into commerce or seizure of the product. So we're going to turn the page here into exam and sam sampling statistics for fiscal year 2019. The first line in this table represents the number of entry lines scored in RAM. Now remember, RAM is our CPSC's internal targeting system, which feeds from ACE. There were over 4.2 million entry lines scored in RAM, and one entry line may have multiple, or one entry may have multiple entry lines and only the entry lines with a tariff under CPSC's jurisdiction and considered to be a priority for the agency are represented as scored in RAM. Now of those 4.2 plus million entry lines, only 0.21% were examined at the port, which is 8,816 exams. Of those exams, 2,600 samples were collected 87% of the samples collected were found violative, and of the violations found, 48% were seized, 14% were permitted to be reconditioned, and 21.2% were allowed to be released into commerce with a notif notice of violation and with the understanding that future production would be corrected. CFP is correct future production. A very small number of products, 10 in fiscal year 2019, was allowed to be destroyed by the importer or, re or exported from the United States. And the average detention time was 44 days. This graph here is, represents CPSC seizures by commodity. You can see that children's toys were the majority of seizures last fiscal year at 47% followed by clothing and footwear at 23% and bags and backpacks at 8%. The remaining products were under 5%, baby toddler products, hair dryers, art materials, et cetera. And this is a breakout of CPSC seizures by mode of transport. Overwhelmingly, uh, ocean cargo or sea cargo was, were, was the number one mode of, of transport for seizures at 60%, followed by truck at 21%, air cargo at 18%, and rail at 1%. And this is a breakout of violations by primary and secondary violations. Your secondary violations are your administrative type violations, like certificates, tracking labels, and product registration cards. And the primary violations are your lead, your mechanical, which is a small part, chemical, phthalates, etc. Entries can have more than one violation type. So, for example, one product could be violative for certificates, tracking labels, and lead. So, take that into consideration. But overwhelmingly, three quarters of the products sampled were violative for certificates and nearly three quarters were violative for tracking labels. As far as primary goes, the lead was the number one violation at 20%, followed by small parts or mechanical at 12%. And then the last couple of slides is on two-way messaging. So two-way messaging is a messaging system that will allow CPSC to communicate directly with CBP and the trade via ACE within existing C CBP messaging structures. How will this affect filers? Well, the filers will receive an under review message from ACE, which signifies that CPSC is reviewing the entry. 
if no examination is required or if the allotted time frame for review has expired, CBP and the filer will receive a may proceed message. If an examination or further review is required, CBP and the filer will receive a hold intact notice or an intensive exam request. The benefits of two-way messaging are that they, it facilitates real-time communications among all trade parties. By automating requests through ACE, CPSC can facilitate more effectively the flow of compliant products into the country while more effectively coordinating with CBP on removing non-compliant products from entering the marketplace. And full rollout, again, is expected as early as this Thursday, September 24th. Or September 24, 2020. And we have arrived at our last polling question. What is the first message the trade will receive from CPSC once two-way messaging is implemented? Is it under review, hold intact, intensive exam, or may proceed? I see the votes are coming in. Thank you all for voting. Okay, we'll give you another five seconds. Okay, very good. Let's close the poll and see what you have said. 89% overwhelming majority said under review. Let's see if you are correct. Very good, under review. That is the first message that you will receive from CPSC, under review, very good. All right, well, that does it for this part of the presentation. Again, I am Marcy Van Winkle, a compliance investigator with the Office of Import Surveillance in the Seattle field office. Also on your screen, you see the contact information for the Director of Import Surveillance and the Deputy Director of Import Surveillance. Um, I think I have a minute or two to answer a couple questions, so. Um, let me see here, Let's see some questions coming, coming in or have come in. Let's see, here's one. Uh, I am a U.S. importer of children's products. My foreign manufacturer provides me with third-party test reports and a, CP, and a CPC prior to me importing my products. Is this acceptable? Uh, the short answer is no. The regulations do state that children's product certificates must be issued by the importer if the product was manufactured overseas. But by all means, you can, you can use that CPC that your manufacturer issued as a guide, but you as the US importer must issue it because you are certifying that the products you're importing meet all applicable US safety standards. Okay, the next question I have, uh, can I attach tracking labels to the product and packaging after they're imported into the United States? Uh, the Consumer Product Safety Act actually requires that the tracking labels be on the product and packaging prior to import. So you as, a, as an importer should work with your foreign manufacturers to, to make sure your products are complying with the tracking label requirement prior to import. Um, but a note on tracking labels, the term label can be a little bit misleading. There are four tracking label elements required, as, as Shelby had mentioned, and, but all of these elements don't have to be on one label or in one place. But as long as all of the elements are permanently affixed somewhere on the product or the packaging as a whole, then the product is considered compliant for the tracking label requirement. Okay, and I will, I think I have time for one more question. So under the under two-way messaging, will my shipment automatically be stopped for an exam if it contains products covered under the tariff codes regulated by CPSC? Uh, no, uh, your shipments will not be automatically stopped. There's, it will 
only be stopped if there is an intensive exam requested or your um, but if it's under review status, that will not hold your shipment. Okay, so I think that's enough. Uh, that's all that we have time for for questions. I'm gonna send it back to Shelby. All right, thank you, Marcy, for that excellent presentation on the importing overview. Now we've got our field screening demo videos, which are gonna last about 20 minutes. This is gonna actually be Marcy Van Winkle, not just in your ears uh, via audio, but it's actually going to be videos of Marcy doing some field screening of products. Before I start the video, I have two uh, disclaimers that I've got to say. I wouldn't be a good CPSC employee if I didn't do this. Uh, the products, Marcy's going to show several products in these field screening videos, and these products that are shown are violative, and Marcy will explain if they are violative and what they were violative for. They're being shown for purposes of this demonstration only and for informational purposes. Uh, it also doesn't represent the entire universe of children's toys. She's going to show several children's toys or Section 15J rule products. She's also going to talk about those. And then the other thing I want to mention is that screening tools that Marcy is using in the upcoming videos are, again, shown for informational purposes only, and they're not meant to serve as an endorsement of those field screening tools that she's using. So with that said, I will go ahead and start our video. Hi, this is Marcy Van Winkle, and I am a compliance investigator with the Office of Import Surveillance in Seattle, Washington. We're going to be showing you four short videos in which we are going to be doing a demonstration of the XRF and we're going to be screening a product for lead. We're going to be doing a demonstration of the FTIR and screening a sample uh, for phthalates. We're going to be looking at a LAMA sample, which is Labeling of Hazardous Art Materials Act. And we're going to be looking at a variety of, of products uh, and evaluating them against the ASTM F963 toy standard, looking at a product for small parts, and also looking at a couple products uh, that are considered substantial product hazards under the Consumer Product Safety Act 15J. In this short video, we're going to do a demonstration of the XRF device. And we're going to field screen an exhibit for lead and an exhibit uh, for the, against the LAMA standard, which is the Labeling of Hazardous Art Materials Act. So this is a X-ray fluorescence device, or an XRF for short, and it's the device that investigators use in the field to detect hazardous elements in children's products. And what I mean by elements are the elements listed in the periodic table of elements. So, of course, we're interested in lead and also the, the heavy elements listed in the ASTM F963 toy standard, which are antimony, arsenic, barium, chromium, cadmium, mercury, and selenium. So the XRF does this by using XRF fluorescence technology to determine and to quantify each element present in a sample. And it does this by emitting a photon beam into a sample that excites the electrons in the atoms of a sample, displacing them, which releases a specific energy. And the XRF is able to determine the element present and the quantity of the element present based on the amount of specific energy released. So for the purposes of this demonstration, we are going to be screening this children's product, and it's a children's shoe. So I'm going to be turning around and screening it behind me. And when I do, when I depress the trigger, you're going to possibly see that the lights are flashing, and that indicates to the user that there's radiation being emitted from the device. So we need to be careful on where we're pointing it when the trigger is being depressed. So I'm going to turn around and I'm going to place the XRF directly on the sample, depress the trigger, and within a matter of seconds, it's going to give me a reading on the display. And normally, I would hold the trigger down for 30 to 60 seconds, but for the purpose of this demonstration, I'm going to stop and I'm going to show you what I'm seeing here. 
So you can see that it is showing lead, which is PB, at 1,347 parts per million. And we know that the legal limit for lead is 100 parts per million for lead content and 90 parts per million for lead and surface coating. So this shoe is well above and beyond the legal limits for lead. So if we were to come across this sample in the field, we would collect random uh, random units from the shipment and send them, send them to our laboratory for further analysis and testing. Okay, so moving on to art materials. An art material is any substance marketed as suitable for use in the creation of art and intended for users of any age. We're going to be looking at a children's art material today. Examples of art material include, but are not limited to, ceramics, clay, chalk, colored pencils, crayons, markers, paint, and watercolor discs. All formulations of art materials that are offered for sale to consumers of all ages in the United States must be evaluated by a toxicologist for their potential to cause adverse chronic health effects prior to such products being offered for sale. After the chronic review has been performed, the toxicologist will recommend the appropriate statement to label that product, such as conforms to ASTM D4236. And this statement can be placed on the product or on the packaging, as long as the consumer is informed that the product's formulation has been reviewed. So the products we're going to be looking at today is this children's art set. And it's composed of three sharks, a paint palette, and a paintbrush. So as we can see, this product is a children's product. It's also marketed by the manufacturer for children. It says ages three plus. So this is a children's product. So not only are we going to be screening this product for against the LAMA standard, but we're also going to be screening it for lead uh, in all of the components of the art kit. We're also going to be looking for tracking information on the product on the front and on the back and on the product itself. So in this case, um, there was no lead in the product, and so now we're going to be screening it for, for LAMA standard. And this is just looking for that statement conforms to ASCM D4236. And in this case, the product did not have that statement on it. So random samples were collected again into our laboratory for evaluation and analysis, and it was determined that this product was violative for LAMA. In this next video, we're going to be doing a demonstration of the FTIR. The FTIR uses infrared spectroscopy, which basically means that a light is passed through the tip of the device into a sample. Some light is absorbed and some light is reflected. And the FTIR, FTIR looks for the missing light and uses that information to identify a sample. The CPSC uses the FTIR to detect a certain set of banned phthalates, and phthalates are a class of chemical additives used as a plasticizer, which imparts flexibility to otherwise rigid plastic. Currently, eight banned phthalates in toys and childcare articles under the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act. And I, when I mean childcare articles, I mean any articles that facilitate eating or sleeping for a child. An example of this is the pacifier. So the pacifier, when we look at the pacifier, um, not only are we going to be screening this for lead in small parts, but we're also going to be screening the nipple portion for phthalates. And what we would do in the field is cut a portion of this and put it into the holder of the device. And then, um, but it, for this purpose of the demonstration, we're not going to be cutting this, but I do have a sample from our laboratory of a small piece of plastic, which does have confirmed phthalates in it. So we would take the sample, which is just a very small piece, only a small piece is needed. We would put it in the holder of the sample in this little bullseye here. And we would take the 
device and snap it into place. Press the scan button. And I'm not sure if you can see that right now, but it is uh, scanning. And now it is performing the analysis. And so what it's doing is it's searching in the library within the device, trying to match it to that sample that we're analyzing. You can see on the screen all of the different phthalates that this device has detected within the sample. There's actually two pages. And what's neat about this device is you can actually pick one and you can view the spectrum and it will show you the spectrum which is actually a, a molecular fingerprint of that molecule. So if for some reason we would get a sample that uh, wasn't uh, a clear reading, we can actually look at the spectrum and compare it against known spectrums for the banned phthalates. In this video, we're going to be screening four different products, three of which are toys, according, and we're going to be screening them against the ASTM F963 toy standard. Uh, but the first is the pacifier. We're going to revisit the pacifier. We did speak a little bit about it during the last video about phthalates. Uh, but also, pacifiers must meet the requirements in 16 CFR 1511. And how we do that is in the field, we have a template, and, this, and the dimensions of this template are broken out in the CFR, and they're also in the ASTM F963, because this is the same template that we would use for toy pacifiers. Now, this is not a toy pacifier. This is an infant pacifier, but it's the same template. And how we would do this is we would rest the pacifier on the template like so, and apply two pounds of pressure of course, this is not official testing. I'm estimating two pounds of pressure, and this is what we do in the field. We do have other technical equipment that we can use, but this is not official. So in the course of applying two pounds of pressure, if the pacifier were to come through the template, that could potentially be a failure of the pacifier safety requirements. Likewise, if we were to apply 10 pounds of pressure, and the pacifier were to break and produce small parts that would fit within the small parts cylinder, that would potentially be a violation of the pacifier standard. In that case, we would collect random units, send them to our laboratory for further analysis. And we're going to be talking a little bit more about this small part cylinder in our next product, which is the children's drawing board. So this drawing board is uh, for children, uh, and that's one of the first questions that we ask ourselves in the investigator, as an investigator in the field is, is this product for children? Because that is what determines what safety standards we're going to evaluate this product. And how we do that is by looking at four criteria. And the first is a statement by the manufacturer about the intended use of the product. And that statement can be found here. The manufacturer is saying that this product is intended for children three plus, three years and older. Second, uh, whether the product is represented in its packaging, display, or promotion as appropriate for use by children. And so here we see um, a picture of a child that looks to me about the age of maybe 18 months, maybe two years. So I am seeing as an investigator conflicting information on the age grade that, for this product. Third, we're looking at how the product is common, would commonly be recognized by consumers as being intended for a child. Would, would consumers uh, look at this as a child for a toddler or a little bit older. And lastly, we're going to be looking at the age determination guidelines, which are issued by the Commission and recently revised in January of this year, 2020, and on our website for anyone uh, to look at. So those four criteria we're going to be looking at when age grading a product. So. Also, because it's a children's product, obviously a children's product, we're going to be screening this for lead, 
uh, potentially phthalates. Um, but also, I'm going to be screening this for small parts. Even though the manufacturer is saying three plus, I'm seeing conflicting information. And as an investigator, I am not authorized to make age determination guidelines. So I'm going to be playing it safe in the field and, and, and screening this for small parts. So the product out of its packaging is here. And it's just a drawing board. It's got a little paper over the, um, the magnetic board here. And it's got a couple magnets, a pen. And so this, these magnets here, they come off. And they're pretty small. So, and they actually fit well within the small part cylinder. So this small part cylinder represents the breathing tube or esophagus of a three-year-old child. So any part that fits within the cylinder without breaking the plane is considered a small part and is banned within products that are intended for children under three. So as an investigator, because of the conflicting age determination, uh, the, the, um, the conflicting ages on the product, um, I would collect this for small parts. And I did, and it was confirmed a violative for small parts. And then the last product we're going to be looking at is this pull along dinosaur. And this product comes in three components, and it's meant uh, for some um, the adult to, to put it together somewhat. So the wooden dowel screws into the back of the dinosaur and then the other wooden doll screws into the top of that. And it's for a child to play. It's a push-pull dinosaur. So it was age graded by the manufacturer at 18 months plus. So it's under three years of age. We're going to be screening this for lead and surface coatings again. There's no plastics on the product. It's all wood, and painted wood, so there's no phthalates to consider. But we're going to be screening this for small parts. Now, this product does not, does not contain small parts as sold, but upon field screening uh, this product, the eyes did come off, and so they do fit well within the small part cylinder. And also, in some instances, the beads came off fairly, fairly easy. So in addition to small parts, though, there's another standard that we can apply to this, and that is ASTM section 432, and that's certain toys with nearly spherical ends. So certain toys with nearly spherical ends, the requirement is, are in, these requirements are intended to address a potential impaction hazard associated with nearly spherical, hemispherical, circular flare or dome-shaped ends on toys or components of toys. Nearly spherical ends of toys or components of toys shall not be capable of penetrating the full depth of the cavity of the supplemental test fixture when tested under the force of their own weight and in a non-compressed state. And this is the test fixture. The dimensions are broken out in the ASTM F963 toy standard. So in order to screen this, the, the, the spherical end cannot penetrate the bottom of this test fixture under its own weight which it clearly does. And it would be considered violative under three conditions. If three conditions are met, the first is the component must weigh less than 1.1 pounds, which it does. And the, and the spherical end must adjoin a shaft or handle or support that has a smaller cross section, which as you can see, it does. And then the third criteria is that it is these are prohibited in toys that are up to 18 months. Now, if you remember, the manufacturer age graded this product at 18 months plus. So if we were to take that at face value, that would put it out of the scope of spherical in, in toys, this, this regulation. So because, like I said, I am an investigator and not uh, authorized to make age determination guidelines, I collected the sample not only for small parts, but to be evaluated for, for the age determination by our Office of Human Factors. And they did come back and age grade this product at 12 months plus, which did, which did put it back into the required to meet the ASTM spherical ends requirement. So this product was found violative for small parts 
and spherical ends. In this video, we will discuss products deemed as substantial product hazards by Section 15 of the Consumer Product Safety Act. A substantial product hazard is a product defect which creates a substantial risk of, in of injury to the public. And there are four products that are deemed to be substantial product hazards. One is hand-supported hair dryers that do not have integral immersion protection. The second is children's upper outerwear in sizes 2T to 16 that contain one or more drawstrings. The third is seasonal and decorative lighting products that lack certain safety characteristics. And lastly, extension cords that, last, that lack certain characteristics, safety characteristics. So in this demonstration, I have two of those products. The first is a hand-supported hair dryer. And I'm gonna read to you what the CPSC defines as a hand-supported hair dryer. Hand-supported hair dryers are defined as an electrical appliance intended to be held with one hand during use, which creates a flow of air over or through a self-contained heating element for the purpose of drying hair. And the reason I read that to you is because this sample that I'm showing you is not your typical hair dryer. It looks like a hairbrush but it does meet the definition of a hand-supported hair dryer because it is an electrical appliance, it's intended to be held with one hand during use, and it creates a flow of air over and through a self-contained heating element for the purpose of drying hair. The purpose of having an integral immersion protection in the device is to reduce the risk of electric shock if the hair dryer is immersed or comes in contact with water, and this protection is provided in a block-shaped plug that incorporates a type of circuit interrupter. And as you can see, this product does not have the required integral immersion protection. So when we're looking at these types of products in the field, it's simply a visual inspection. We are determining whether or not it is, meets the definition of a hand-supported hair dryer, and we're looking it, whether or not it has an integral immersion protection. In this case, it did not. Samples were collected for further evaluation and this product was found violative. And the second sample that we're going to be looking at are children's upper outerwear for drawstrings. And this is a children's poncho, a wool poncho, and it's the size two. So the commission has determined that hood and neck drawstrings on children's upper outerwear in sizes 2T to 12 are a strangulation hazard and a substantial product hazard. So in this case, this is a children's upper outerwear in size 2. It has neck or hood drawstrings. It's a violation of 15J. So in this case, just as in the hair dryers, it's a simple visual examination. We determine it is, if it is a children's upper outerwear and if it and if it is within the size restrictions, size requirements, then if it contains drawstrings, then it would be a prohibited product. Samples were collected and evaluated at our lab and this was determined to be violative for drawstrings. Hi, ev hi, everyone. We recognize that it is at two hours now, so we are going to be conscious of your time, but I did want to get to at least one port question, one import question that was asked during the videos, and that was um, that I'm importing a product that has been detained at the port. Um, I've imported a product that has been detained at the port in the past and the storage charges add up fast. Is there an option for importers to pay an expedited fee in order to speed up CPSC testing and reduce the detention time? Um, the answer to that is unfortunately no. Uh, all samples are processed by the CPSC in the order that they are received, but there is a few best practices 
uh, that you're, as an importer, you can instill in the first is to be responsive to CPSC's requests for more information. Uh, the second, and probably the most important, well, equally important anyway, is to make sure that your certificates and third-party test reports even are provided to your customs broker and uploaded with your entry documents to DIS. And so that way, even before your shipment is imported, CPSC may have the opportunity to review your documents and may elect not to examine your product based on your provided certificates. So very good question. Um, Shelby, I'm gonna turn it back over to you for questions. All right, thanks so much, Marcy. Um, first off, I wanna say we understand that if folks were attending by phone call for audio that they might have had trouble hearing the videos. I think some folks were having problems with their media player properly playing the videos or hearing the audio there. Our apologies. The great news is that within days of today's webinar, everyone who registered, so folks that attended today and people that registered but couldn't make it today, are going to get an email from Elizabeth Erdman, just like you did on the registration side. That email is going to contain a link to today's recording, so you do have the ability to watch um, the 20-minute video that we just saw of Marcy doing field screening and hopefully hear audio at that time. This is the last time where you guys are going to be able to download the handout of today's presentation with the links via PDF, so I want to remind you to do that. Anybody who submitted questions, we tried to get to almost every question that we could. We know we've run three minutes over, so we're conscious of that. We're gonna download the questions we didn't answer today, and you will be hearing from either somebody in import surveillance or somebody from the Small Business Ombudsman team with an answer to your question very soon. And then the last thing I've got is that um, a feedback survey is gonna pop up on your screen once I end this webinar. We are doing our absolute best to offer content that folks find useful. We would really love your input. It's one question and the ability for you to type in any comments that you would like for us to receive. So with that, I will say thank you so much for attending today. Thank you to Marcy as well for presenting with me. If you have questions, you've got our contact info on the screen, and we hope you have a great, safe rest of your day.